Mr. Witt, I need for you to help me with something with those, that box back there, if you would. If, if you're a father this morning, I'm just going to ask if you'd stand, if you would. All my fathers in the room, if you'd stand. Uh, D, if you would help. Uh, Brother Larry, would you help D, if you would? Brother Joe, would you help pass these out? We've got something for each of our fathers this morning. And remain standing, if you guys would, until... Each one of you received that. Just a token of our appreciation for you standing for the Lord Jesus and standing for the church of God. All of our fathers this morning. All right, guys, you are moving right along. Thank you, guys. If you've got yours, you may be seated if you would. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for helping me with that. We'll look at a familiar scripture text. Don't know whether or not it's necessarily a Father's Day message. I wanted to bring something that would uh, certainly touch our dads, but uh, all of us at the same time. If you have Genesis 32, I'll ask that you'll stand with me for the reading of God's precious word this morning. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 32, begin in verse number 24. And Jacob was left alone, and there he wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he says, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he says, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he says, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him and says, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he says, Wherefore is, is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the place of uh, called the name of the place Penel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Father, we thank you for the brief moment that we'll meet here this morning, and we thank you, Father, for these that have come out on a summertime Sunday, Father's Day, 2014. Lord, we ask just for the time that we will invest, that you'd give us clarity of thought, and Father, thy will be done. Father, we thank you for the men that's represented in this room. Father, as you look at their faces, no doubt many have gone through the battles, many have scars, and many, Lord, has not lived a simple and easy life. But Father, one thing that they understand is their relationship with Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray that as we conclude this message that we would just remember our relationship with you. And as we will discover how we need to hold on to you. Father, we thank you for what you do in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. As we're going to meet a Bible character who appears to have it made. He worked real hard, had many possessions, and he seemed to love the Lord. Well, there was something that uh, this particular gentleman had done years ago as a youth that still bothered him. As a young man, he knew how to get what he wanted, and he was very good at manipulating people. However, for the last 20 years or so, he had been working hard to get his life together. Keep your Bibles open because we have several scriptures to look at early in this message. But I invite your attention to Genesis chapter 31. Genesis chapter 31, verse 38. The Bible says, This 20 years have I been with thee, thy ewes and thy she-goats, and have not cast their young, and thy rams and thy flock have I not eaten. Look at verse number 39. That which was uh, torn of beast, I brought none unto thee. I bear the loss of it of my hand, didst thou require it, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. Thus I was, in the day and in the drought, consume me in the frost by night, and my sleep departed from my eyes. Look at verse 41. Thus have I been twenty years in thy house. I have served thee fourteen years for thy two daughters, six years for thy cattle, and thou hast changed my wages, the Bible says, ten times. Now, of course, you know that we're speaking about a man by the name of Jacob. 
But all the things he had done to his brother Esau is now starting to catch up to him. And you know the story how he got Esau to sell him his birthright and how he conned his father Isaac out of Esau's blessing. And of course, not to mention how his mother Rebekah loved him more than he loved uh, than she loved Esau. So there was just a lot of drama going on in that particular home. But now after Jacob has been away for 20 years, he hears something that startles him. Go, if you will, to Genesis chapter 27, verse 41. Genesis chapter 27, <clears throat> verse number 41. And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessings wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in, thy, in his heart, the days of mourning for my father are now at hand, and I will slay my brother Jacob. Look at verse 42. And these words of Esau, her elder son, were told to Rebekah, and she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said unto him, Behold, thy brother Esau, as touching thee, doth comfort himself. Look at this last part. Proposing to, proposing to kill thee. Now, I don't know about you, but it doesn't seem like to me this is a healthy relationship going on in this home. Here you see favoritism of one son over the other. Here you see that uh, the things have gotten so out of, out, of, uh, out of bounds that one son was threatened to murder his other brother. Notice, if you will, back at Genesis chapter 32, trying to set the scene, paint the picture, and then we'll give you some applications for the message this morning. We understand that uh, Jacob understood that Esau hated him. Look at verse number 6. Genesis chapter 32 and verse number 6. And the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, uh, We came to thy brother Esau, and also he cometh to meet thee, and four hundred men with him. Uh, then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people that was with him, and the flocks and the herds, and the camels and the bands. Now listen to this. The last words over 20 years ago that Jacob had heard his brother say that I want to kill you. Now follow, follow me with this. Now 20 years later, some of Jacob's men comes to him and says something like this. Jacob, I don't know if you're aware of this, but you need to be, you need to be told your brother Esau is coming to you. They've got 400 men and they're riding your way. Now let me just tell you this. Don't take a bright, bright man to understand this. He understood that Esau was probably not bringing him long departed birthday presents. He probably understood that uh, he wasn't bringing him his Christmas presents. What he understood was 20 years ago Esau wanted to kill me. Now he understands that I'm out on my own. I'm away from Laban now. Now he's coming with 400 men. And now my situation is just as hopeless as it possibly can be. The Bible says in verse number 7 of Genesis 32, Jacob was greatly afraid in distress. Now listen to this. By all of this time, 20 years has elapsed, that Jacob had two wives. If you read your Old Testament, you, you know this, Rachel and Leah and many children. Now Jacob had finally gotten away from Laban to begin his new life. Now his brother is coming with a vengeance. His worst, worst nightmare is coming true, and he knows he has little time to get anything accomplished. Now, before we get too carried away with this story, a question comes to mind, and it is this. If you were in a situation such as Jacob, just how far would you go to seek the blessings of the Lord? Many times we want the blessings of the Lord without seeking the blesser. Is anybody awake this morning? You see, we want all of the blessings of God, but we just don't want to do anything to seek the blessings of God. It's Sir Francis Drake in 1577 wrote something that I'm not so sure that God doesn't do for us today. Notice these powerful words that he penned. He writes, Disturb us, Lord, when we are too well pleased with ourselves, when our dreams have come true because we have dreamed too little, when we arrive safely because we have sailed too close to the shore. Disturb us, Lord, when this abundance of things we possess we have lost our thirst for the waters of life. Having fallen in love with life, we have ceased to dream of eternity. And in our efforts to build a new earth, we have allowed our vision of the new heaven to dim. Disturb us, Lord, to dare more boldly, to venture on wider seas where storms will show your majesty. 
where losing sight of land we shall find the stars. We ask you to push back the horizons of our hopes and to push us into the future in strength, courage, hope, and love. What Sir Francis Drake was saying, sometimes we need to be disturbed, so that way we're going to find out who and what God is all about. Amen. Now listen to me. Before you doze, let me give you this. Each one of us in here in this room understands this important principle, or you ought to. Without God's aid, without His benefit, and without His blessings, friend, we are hopeless, and it's a hopeless situation. I want to just submit to you this morning, some of you walked into this building this morning, and perhaps there is a situation on your heart. Maybe there has been something told to you. Maybe your mind is consumed with a problem or a situation, and you have asked yourself for many days and weeks, how in the world am I going to get out of this problem? How in the world, preacher, you don't understand because it just seems like I am so overwhelmed. My mind is never at ease. My body is tense all the time. I have all of this drama coming from within and without. And preacher, I just simply don't know what to do. Let me ask you this. If you are in one of those situations, good news. Good news. Because there is a remedy. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. There is... A remedy. And I'm going to show that to you uh, this morning. Disrupting Jacob may be what Lord was trying to do. And the reason why is to try to, ra to raise him to a new awareness of the where God is and what God is all about. Would you look up here and let me just give you something. And I want you to just to ponder this statement. All right. Are you ready for this? I think the longer we come to church and the longer that we're saved, we just get comfortable with our relationship with God. We just get comfortable. Now watch this, watch this, watch this. We pray the same small prayers. We, 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 we think that God is, is in our little box. And any time that we need God in our little box, we just open it pull his chain, rub his lamp, and expect God to poof up in the air and to bless us. We get so comfortable with where we are spiritually, and when we hear a message like this, it just it does not resonate because it just rolls off our backs. Preacher, you don't, you don't honestly expect me to understand that there is a new a level where God wants me to be. Yes, that's exactly what I'm telling you this morning. Each and every one of us in this room, I will submit to you this morning, we are to be dare to go up and to try to reach the highest level possibly spiritually that we can. And the only reason we do not do so is because, like Jacob, we get comfortable. I dare to say this about you, and it's probably true. Probably at mealtime, it's the same prayers. Probably in your devotions, it's the same thoughts. Probably when you walk into the church, it's your same familiar spot. Well, I won't go there, all right? I'm just glad that you're here. But I am just tell it, trying to get, get you to understand that sometimes we just get real smoothy comfortable with God and when he wants to speak to our lives sometimes we are so distracted and so we're disjointed and we just don't hear him anymore now watch this I believe it is my personal listen it's my personal uh, conviction that God still speaks to human beings today and God still speaks and desires for you and I listen to do and accomplish more than we ever thought possible. I believe there is an awareness of God that we've not even got to yet. And friend, I want to tell you, and this is where Jacob is. And God is trying to tell Jacob something. And look, you are in a situation. Your brother Esau is coming with 400 men. And as far as you're concerned, he, you think that J, uh, Esau is coming to kill you and everything that you have. Jacob, what are you going to do about it? All my life, growing up in church, I've heard saints of God say this statement. And maybe you've said it. Preacher, the Lord does never put any more on us than we can bear. That's a fallacy. I don't know who dreamed that up. But that's a fallacy. 
What do you mean the Lord don't put any more on you than what you can bear? Sure He does. And you know the reason He does? So you know who He is. Friend, listen, if you don't have more on you than you can bear, you would never call out to God. You would never want His provision. You would never pray of a morning. You would never pray over a sick relative. You would never want to do what God wants you to do. Yes, He puts more on you than you can bear. Why? Because He wants to demonstrate to you what a great Savior He is. I don't know who ever thought about that. I've heard people tell me that all my life and I've started examining it. And I'm thinking that, that just doesn't make sense because if everything was just peachy and cream to me all the time, listen, why would I need God? Why would I need church? Why would I need a relationship with Him? Is anybody following this this morning? Friend, listen to me. We have these little cliches we've heard all of our life and when we're exposed with them, you'll say, well, preacher, I, I don't know about that. Yeah, you need to understand about this because there are pressure-packed situations that you and I go through every single week. Friend, I want to tell you, that's the reason why He is so wonderful. That's the reason why He meets your needs. That's the reason why He died on the cross. And that's the reason why you're here this morning. Because you have a need. And you want to know how you can get in touch with God. Friend, listen to me. I think that this morning, when we'll discover some thoughts, maybe it's going to help you as it has helped me. When it comes to spiritual, spiritual things, do you and I demonstrate the same zeal or passion we do for physical things? What if you were burdened down so much that you didn't know what to do? What if there was something so heavy coming your way? Let me just give you this. What if 400 men were coming your way? Wait a minute. I don't think you're getting this. It might not be 400 men. It might be that doctor's phone call that you've dreaded to hear. It might be that when you go into work Monday morning, you know what you're fixing to face is not going to be pleasant. You know that there is a brother or sister or mom and dad that you've been estranged with for years. And maybe they've been st starting some things and rumors have gotten back to you. And you say, Preacher, this has just been so heavy on me. I just don't understand how they can talk like this behind my back. Do you understand what I'm talking about? It may not be 400 men that's coming your way, but it could be something else. And the reason why that something else may be coming your way is simply because of this. Maybe you have forgotten just how good God is. Maybe your prayer life and my prayer life has gotten stale. Maybe reading the Bible has just been the same old words lately. Maybe your mind is so preoccupied that when you sit down with the greatest love letter that's ever been penned, you rarely get anything out of that. You remember those times when you used to read the Bible, you used to get your highlighter and highlight, highlight some scriptures, and your heart used to be just absolutely delighted by you learning a new truth. Now you don't know where your highlighter is. Now your Bible is at dust. You keep it in your car. Your book of your Bible has just drawn back because of the sun, and you don't even know where it is anymore. That's our spiritual life. Notice, if you will, Genesis 32, 24. Genesis 32, 24. It says this, And Jacob, here's a good verse, was left alone. And there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. What this verse says is that Jacob was alone. Everybody look up here because you know this is true. Some of our greatest battle in our lives have taken place when we are all alone. Someone said this, you are the real you in private. But something else happened in verse number 24. The Bible says that Jacob wrestled until the breaking of the day. Now, I'll explain this a little bit more, but I want to just tell you this. <clears throat> if you're wrestling a man to the breaking of the day, that takes great endurance. That takes great stamina. That takes great strength. Here's what the lesson for you and I is this morning. Watch. Here's what it's talking about. Beloved, if you and I ever want to get our prayers answered, if you and I ever want to get our spiritual lives in tune with God, it's not the weak, it's not the 
faulty. It's not those who get out of the church and those that fall away on the sidelines. It's those who constantly, in spite of all difficulties, will continue to do what they know that is right to do. Somebody say amen. What you need to understand this morning is what you and I need to accomplish this, is keep the main thing the main thing. And that's Christ Jesus. When your body is tired and it's Wednesday night, come on anyway. When your finances is low and you don't know what you're going to do, tithe anyway. When you, listen, you're at your wit's end and you're just going to blame it all on God, you serve Him anyway. Friend, listen to me. I'm telling you, it takes stamina today to serve Jesus Christ. For those that are weak and those on the sidelines and for those that just want to falter and faint, beloved, you're never going to experience the goodness of God and His sweetness that He gives to us that love Him, that call Him Father, that call Him Abba. Here's what I've noticed about you and I. Many here have a lot of enthusiasm at the beginning of projects and programs. But to accomplish something worthwhile simply means this. Watch, don't fade on this. If I have a lot of enthusiasm at the start of my project, friend, can I ask you this? Do you have that much enthusiasm at the end of your project? Let me give you a case in, a, a case in point. Several years ago, we had a vision and a dream about building this worship facility. And it took us probably in 10 years of planning and 10 years of praying and 10 years of sweating. Friend, listen to me. We got real excited at times. And at times the project would move and then it would stop. And then it would move a little bit and then it would stop for months and it seemed like years. And it just seems like, are we ever going to accomplish anything, Lord? What we understood was this, that God, watch, 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 watch. God was moving us along in His time. God was moving us along when He knew that it was best. But here's what we understood. Even though I didn't understand Him, even though I didn't understand His program at the time, I did know this. I needed as much enthusiasm and endurance at the beginning as I did at the end. Same thing with you. How many of you are just real gun ho when something good or something begins in your life? And then the months and the years come on. And you just seem, you kind of just seems to slide under the table, spiritually speaking. You find a hard time of picking up the Word of God. You find it hard to keep your train of thought. Why? Because you are mesmerized by the world. Friend, I want to tell you this. Jacob was in a dilemma and he needed a Savior to come and rescue him. The last 20 years has seemed like a, a, a picnic compared to his present situation. Notice, if you will, Genesis 32, 29. Genesis 32, 29. I'm skipping some stuff to get, to get you out of here. Genesis 32, 29. And Jacob asked him and says, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he says, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. This verse seems to indicate that Jacob knew who this man he was. He was wrestling. The person Jacob wrestled with was an angel of God. And if you'll look this up, you that you love your Bible, put in the margin of your Bible, this is called a theophany. Oh, preacher, I didn't know you knew a word like that. Yeah, every now and then I get something like this. It's a theophany. And what that means, it's an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ. Who has Jacob got a hold of that night? Wait a minute, whoa, 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 whoa. Who did Jacob get a hold of that night? It was Jesus. He had a wrestling match with the Lord. I'm pretty sure that don't make sense. Hang on with me. I'm going to give you some sense out of this. Because this is what I needed this week. And here in just a few minutes. This is what you're going to need as well. Jacob was not fighting against God, but fighting to gain a blessing from God. In Genesis 32, 25, it says, And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. <laughs> now, friend, can I tell you this? It's bad enough to wrestle when you've got good arms and good legs, right? Now, because he wrestled with the Lord... He, Jacob now had a handicap. And, but here's what Jacob understood. Now watch this. I'm not 
going to stop until God blesses me. Wait a minute. Watch, watch. I'm not going to give up in spite of my handicap, in spite of my difficulties, in spite of me not wanting to go on, in spite of my body saying it hurts. I'm not going to quit until God gives me the victory. Did anybody hear that this morning? Until God gives me the victory. Wow. How many of us, after a prayer or two, we faint and don't continue to go on? Don't continue to pursue God. Don't continue to do what God wants us to do. In Genesis 32, 26, he says, Let me go for the day breaketh. And he says, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. Friend, I don't know about you, but here's what you and I have to understand. We can't let go of Jesus Christ until we are sure that we get the victory. Can somebody say amen? I'm talking about hold on, brothers and sisters. Hold on when the situation is tight. Hold on when you don't know what to do. Don't fall away. Don't get discouraged. And don't say it's no use. Friend, listen to me. When, when, when disaster strikes, when the phone rings with that news, when you don't understand, I'm telling you, hold on until you get a breakthrough. Anybody hearing that this morning? Men, this is for you. Typically all over the land of the United States of America today, there are more women engaged in church worship than men. Preacher, you're saying you don't want women at church? No. But here is what I'm saying. We need to get men engaged in a relationship with Jesus Christ. We need to get men to get the strength of the church and the backbone of the church and to get back to where we were years ago and to understand and let you men understand this. You that are trying to do it on your own. You that are trying to answer your questions and your prayers on your own. You that think you've got it figured out by now. You're 20 or 30 or 40 years old and you believe by this time in your life that it's all okay. Somehow you have got to believe and somebody has told you, well, it doesn't matter what you believe. You just do what you've got to do and somehow it all work out beloved we've got a culture of men that believe that today we've got a culture of men that just simply are going by the seat of their pants they have no spiritual backbone they have no nothing to guide their lives in Genesis 32 verse number 11 it says deliver me I pray thee from the hand of my brother from uh, the hand of Esau for I fear him lest he come and smite me and my mother with the children and listen, I'm done with this. I'm done. The lesson that he learned. Come here, Brother Robert. Let me use you for a minute. You're close. Here at this church, we are fortunate because we have a friendly, outgoing church. And here's what many of you have figured out by now. When you come into Calvary Baptist Church, you're going to get your hand shook or somebody's going to hug your neck. It's just because... We appreciate you and love you. But Jacob took that to a new level. Jacob had God in front of him. 400 men coming. And God. What am I going to do? Well, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold on until God tells me it's enough. Don't let go. Thank you, Robert. Don't let go. Don't let go. Summertime, it's so easy to just let go. You're hot. You're bothered. You're cranky. And that's on your good days. But this last week, I did not know how much I was going to need this message. I had no way of knowing. 
I studied it and prepared. And here's what I found out. Friday, I talked to Jonathan. And he said that Becky went through the easy biopsy. And they had good news Friday, and I was encouraged. 3.45, Saturday morning, Jonathan called me and said, Preachers, things took a turn for the worst. The lungs have just filled up, and their kidneys has given away. Tammy was signing powers of attorney. Came in and told the family Saturday, it's just a matter of moments. This morning at 10.30, Becky graduated to glory. It's been hard this weekend, to say the least. Jonathan and them are just beyond description of what to say or do. Becky's earthly fight's over. Now she's home. She's home. All I could tell Jonathan this weekend, hang on, Jonathan. Hang on. As far as we know right now, they have... uh, going to donate Becky's body and unless they have convinced Tammy otherwise then uh, no memorial no funeral service we're hoping that we could have something here at the church Jacob understood a principle that I'm trying to teach us It don't make sense. It don't make sense. All I know to tell you is... Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Tammy and the family request our prayers and they're going to need for you and I to be sensitive towards the toward the urgent need I don't know when they'll be coming back hopefully this evening we'll get some more details but this we're sure of God answered our prayers, not what we wanted. But she's pain free now. Father, we thank you for the time we've invested. Father, we know that our earthly tabernacles get old and wore out. Father, the journey that our Becky has been on has been long and hard.
but on this Sunday morning, thank you, God, to see her Redeemer and her Savior. Father, and I pray in the next hours that you'd help this family. Father, I pray that you give them a peace that passes all understanding. I'm going to invite you, if you would, those that are able, those that can, would just come to the front and let's pray for the family. And ask God's abundant grace and mercy upon them, if you will.